Your lecturer is Stephen Gimbel. Dr. Gimbel is a professor of philosophy at Gettysburg College. His research focuses on the philosophy of physics, and he is the author of several books, including Einstein, His Space and Times. Hi, I'm Steve Gimbel, a philosopher of physics from Gettysburg College. Now, when I tell people I'm a philosopher of physics, I generally get one of two responses. The usual one is, philosophy of physics? Excuse me, and then the person walks away. But a close second is simply a look of bafflement. Philosophy of physics? Aren't philosophy and physics opposites? The short answer is no. The long answer is these 12 lectures. We'll examine philosophical questions that arise from the progress of physical science. The most important word in that last sentence is from. The philosophical problems arise from the doing of physics. Philosophers don't do physics, and physicists and philosophers have different jobs. Physicists get paid more. Let's start by clearly setting out what philosophy is, what physics is, examine how philosophy of physics came to be, and start to look at some philosophical questions that arise out of physics. So what is physics? It's the scientific study of the non-living part of the natural world, or at least the study that doesn't worry about the nature of life. There is, of course, biophysics that examines the physical aspects of living things, but what makes it physics and not biology is that it's concerned with the behaviors that don't depend on life itself. Physics begins with the presupposition that we live in an ordered universe. The objects and events that are part of the universe follow certain rules, and those rules are accessible to the human mind. We call them laws of nature. Physics is the search for these laws of nature. Why presume there are laws of nature? Well, originally scientists like Isaac Newton gave a theological basis. The universe was created by a perfect God, and an ordered universe was evidence of his perfection. With the rejection of a religious basis, the well-ordered nature of the universe is held to be a rational belief based on the success physicists have had so far. If there were no discoverable patterns of behavior within the world, then science would be impossible. We've made some amazing discoveries so far, so the project seems to work. What is the project? The branches of physics correspond to seemingly distinct sorts of phenomena which we observe. Traditionally, there are eight branches of physics. One, mechanics, the study of objects in motion. Two, gravitation, the study of the attraction between objects. Three, thermodynamics, the study of heat. Four, electricity, the study of electrical charge. Five, magnetism, the study of magnetic forces that can be observed in some objects from metals to the earth itself. Six, optics, the study of light. Seven, material science, the study of matter. And eight, astronomy and cosmology, the study of things we see in the sky, especially their origin. The history of physics has caused a number of these eight branches to join together while, at the same time, further branching into subfields. Isaac Newton in the 17th century gave us the most important theory in the history of humanity. It combined mechanics and gravitation. In the 19th century, James Clerk Maxwell framed the kinetic theory of heat, arguing that matter was comprised of molecules and that heat was just the motion of these molecules. This meant that heat, what physicists following Aristotle thought was a substance unto itself, was really just motion, and so thermodynamic properties like temperature and pressure could be explained mechanically. This meant that thermodynamics reduced to mechanics. This reduction led to the possibility of laws of nature that could explain in principle, but not in practice, because everyday objects were made up of so many molecules. The result was that we'd need statistical laws to describe the motion of great collections of molecules. We call this statistical mechanics. And Maxwell didn't stop there. He collected laws about electricity and magnetism and showed that these two seemingly distinct physical phenomena were just flip sides of the same coin. He thus united them into a single theory of electromagnetism. If that wasn't enough, he went on to show that light 
was an electromagnetic wave, thereby bringing optics under the umbrella of electromagnetism. So we have mechanics, gravitation, and thermodynamics as one unified branch, and electricity, magnetism, and optics as another. Albert Einstein, with his work in the first half of the 20th century, then brought these two mega branches together into a single meta branch through his theory of relativity. Matter remained its own branch. Through the 20th century, physicists examined the nature of matter. Maxwell, in the 19th century, gave us reason to think that the stuff we see around us is comprised of what he termed molecules, but left it at that. He had no way of determining whether they existed or what their properties were, so he just pictured them as infinitely hard, perfectly spherical objects with no electrical charge. But in the 20th century, figures like J.J. Thompson, Ernest Rutherford, and Niels Bohr developed atomic theory, according to which these molecules were atoms that were made up of charged, massive particles like electrons, protons, and neutrons. Bohr led the way to quantum theory, which made these tiny elements of the world bizarre. Quantum theory led to the standard model, our best current account of the universe, and its behavior at the smallest scale. Different states of matter behave differently. Solids are unlike liquids, and if we put in enough energy, we get plasma. As a result, we have a number of different subfields here. Solid state physics, high energy physics, plasma physics, nuclear physics. The hope, of course, is to unify all this with the rest of physics, the way Maxwell and Einstein did with so much of the rest. But for reasons we'll discuss later, this has been, let us say, a challenge. The final field, cosmology, has come to be one place where the results of all the other branches are utilized. On the one hand, there should be nothing in space that's not here on Earth, so cosmology should just be an application of the other branches. On the other hand, is a middle finger, and that's what the universe flips us when we try to simplify. Dark matter and dark energy are riddles that don't seem to be answered by the rules that govern what we see around us. And then, of course, there's the question about the laws governing the early universe, just after the Big Bang, which again, fail to conform to the laws as we see them. So, cosmology is informed by the rest of physics, but it too remains its own branch. So that's physics. What then is philosophy? An old friend of mine used to say that if you ask why once, why is the sky blue, why do birds sing, now you're a scientist. If you ask why twice, why is that the answer, now you're a philosopher. If you ask why more than twice, now you're just a three-year-old annoying your mother. Philosophy doesn't study observable phenomena. If there's a question that's answered by observation, that's a scientific question, not a philosophical one. Philosophy is concerned with what we call a priori questions, that is, questions that are prior to experience. We ask conceptual questions, questions about values, questions that may be relevant to the world around us, but whose answer does not require investigation into the behavior of the world. There are four branches to philosophy. One, logic, the study of rational argumentation. In other words, what truths follow from what other truths and to what degree? Two, epistemology, the study of knowledge. For example, what is knowledge? What can we know? Can we know anything? If not, how do we know this? Three, metaphysics, the study of reality. It deals with questions of existence and the nature of existing things, such as, is there a world beyond our internal experience of it? Is there free will? Is there a God? Four, axiology, the study of value judgments. There are two subfields of axiology. A, ethics, the study of value judgments regarding right and wrong for free human actions. And B, aesthetics, the study of value judgments concerning beauty. So. Where among these branches does philosophy of physics sit? The answer is yes. Physics gives rise to questions in all four branches. Now, the vast majority of questions, though, fall under metaphysics and epistemology, so that's going to be the almost exclusive interest engaged in the following lectures. In this lecture, though, we'll work our way through a couple of questions in axiology. But before we do that, let us see how philosophy of physics came to be. I'm not infrequently asked whether philosophy and physics are competitors. 
whether there are different ways of coming to answers to the same big questions. Often, the assumption behind the question is that if we examine the history of ideas, what we see is questions that began as philosophical fodder that ended up getting new and better answers once physics had developed to a point where the question could be answered. Is philosophy then just unripe physics? When physics finally advances far enough, does that mean philosophy is going to become obsolete? It is true that science was at one time a part of philosophy, along with virtually every other field of study from biology to economics to literary theory. Physics begins with the philosophy of Aristotle, perhaps the most brilliant human to ever walk the planet. According to Aristotle, all sciences are designed to explain the causes of observable phenomena. Aristotle said that what makes science tricky is that when we ask for the cause of something, we're actually asking four distinct questions because there are four different causes for each thing. There's the material cause, that is, what something is made of. There's the formal cause, in other words, the structure of the thing. There's the efficient cause, what we normally think when we use the word that which brought the thing about. And finally, the final cause, that for the sake of which the thing was created. Science, Aristotle argued, has to be able to specify all four of these causes for all natural things. And so he did. This was Aristotle's project. Because there's a material cause and an efficient cause, one result is that Aristotle's theory of the world gives us chemistry as coming before physics. If you want to know why water falls straight to the ground or fire goes straight up, the answer to these physics question comes from the prior study of a thing's chemistry. According to Aristotle, all things around us are made up of four earthly elements, earth, water, air, and fire. Each of these things has a natural place, and the natural motion of an object is in a straight line to its natural place, at which point it will remain at rest. However, when we look at the sky, what we see is the sun, the moon, and the stars doing something completely different. They move in circles. Why? Well, materially, this must be because they're made of something different from the things around us. They, Aristotle argued, are made of a fifth element, ether. Since circles are the perfect shape, Ether is perfect, unlike the earthly elements. The final cause of perfect motion would have to be perfection itself. That is, it's the love of God that causes the astronomical bodies to forever carry out their perfect circular orbits. Aristotle's physics was adopted as the official doctrine of the Catholic Church, with modifications for Christian theological constraints. But Declaring a scientific theory to be true is not how science works, and cracks in the view appeared. The scientific revolution changed everything. Copernicus displaced the Earth from the center of the universe. Kepler figured out that planets had elliptical orbits. Galileo developed the first equations of motion. Descartes developed analytic geometry, which allowed for equations that accounted for more than straight line motion. In doing so, Descartes started to give us a new kind of scientific theory, one that relied only on the world. His physics and philosophy held that we could understand the world by only looking at the world. No longer was there the need to introduce external or supernatural causes. The mechanistic philosophy of Descartes said that physics was a self-contained study. It was a view that Isaac Newton despised, yet to which he ended up making the most important addition. Newton developed a stronger mathematical machine, calculus, that allowed him to create a theory that accounted for the motion of the planets, the falling of apples, the tides, the shape of the Earth, the orbits of comets. When his law of universal gravitation was challenged on the ground that it didn't explain what exactly it was that was doing the pulling, Newton responded with three words, hypotheses non-fingo. I frame no hypotheses. In other words, physics doesn't give explanations, but mathematically accurate descriptions of observable phenomena. This was, however, a bit disingenuous on Newton's part. He thought there was a cause, God. 
to his chagrin, he gave physicists tools sufficiently powerful that they could do physics without any of the philosophical or theological presuppositions he held dear. Physics could be done by observing and then developing a purely mathematical account to cover the observations. For 300 years, his theory was the beating heart of physics. By the end of the 19th century, many were sure that physics was almost a complete science. Almost everything was explained. Just a couple of small details to be wrapped up by somebody clever. Of course, those details were more problematic than anyone realized. And in 1905 and then in 1916, a young patent clerk living in Bern, Switzerland, came up with a new theory, the theory of relativity that unseated Newton. Albert Einstein's theory was revolutionary, and not just in physics. Yes, he had new equations, but more importantly, he had new concepts. We had to reinterpret what we understood by mass, energy, motion, space, and time. And when you have to understand your basic concepts in a new way, we have a name for that, philosophy. Einstein's theory was a revolution in physics, but it also sparked a revolution in philosophy. A group of philosophically-minded scientists and scientifically-minded philosophers collected themselves in Vienna and Berlin to try to make sense of the revolution and say what it meant for all of human thought. These were the first modern philosophers of physics, and they called themselves the logical positivists. Launched by Maurice Schlick, a former student of the great physicist Max Planck, in Vienna and Hans Reichenbach, one of the small handful of students who took Einstein's own very first seminar in general relativity in Berlin, logical positivism sought to use the physics of Einstein to create a new way of philosophizing. Leading figures like Rudolf Carnap, Otto Neurath, Hans and Rose Hahn, Kurt Gödel, were the logical positivists who set out to do to philosophy what Einstein did to physics. They sought to overthrow the philosophy of the 19th century, which became alienated, even hostile to science. They saw philosophy at the beginning of the 20th century as just a bunch of meaningless nonsense clothed in fancy jargon meant to impress people. Sometimes you have to tear down before you can build up. To understand logical positivism, think about cleaning out your refrigerator. Start by emptying out the fridge and the freezer and put everything on the kitchen floor. Now, step one is to go item by item and see if it should be thrown away or if it's still good and should be saved. Step two is to take all the stuff that needs to be saved and separate it into two groups, that which goes into the refrigerator and that which goes into the freezer. The last two steps are to put all the freezer stuff away in an organized fashion and to put all the fridge stuff away in an organized fashion. This is what logical positivism would do for all human knowledge. The first step, culling out the bad from the good, was meant to take all the things we believed and determine which ones were actually meaningful and which ones were nonsense. For this, they sought a criterion of cognitive significance. For a proposition to be meaningful, it had to say something about the world, something that could be confirmed by observation. Non-observable metaphysical claims about God, free will, or anything else that couldn't be empirically tested would just be thrown away. The division between fridge and freezer is metaphorically what Immanuel Kant termed the analytic-synthetic distinction. Kant, a century and a half before the logical positivists, argued that there are two kinds of truths, analytic and synthetic truths. Now, analytic truths are necessary truths, sentences that have to be true, whose negations are contradictions. These are the truths of logic and mathematics. Synthetic truths are contingent truths, facts that just happen to be true because that turns out to be the way the world happens to be, but it could be otherwise. Think of the difference between these two sentences. Bachelors are unmarried and bachelors are slobs. The first is an analytic proposition. Given what we mean by the words in the sentence, it has to be true because a bachelor is an unmarried male human. The second is true, but not necessarily. 
bachelors don't have to be slobs. It's just a fringe benefit. Having created two categories of truth, we now need accounts for what it means to be each sort of truth. For analytic propositions, we need a philosophy of mathematics. And for synthetic propositions, we need a philosophy of science. For the most interesting synthetic propositions, we need a philosophy of physics. And they created one, or several. The logical positivists were the founding mothers and fathers of philosophy of physics. Indeed, we can see most contemporary philosophy of physics as a response to logical positivism or a response to a response to logical positivism. These responses are needed because the logical positivist project failed. Serious objections or fatal flaws were found in all four pillars, many by the positivists themselves in a spirit of intellectual honesty. It was a grand attempt to instantiate a bold vision, but its shortcomings give us plenty of places to play, and that will be the bulk of what we will discuss in the following conversations. But before we go there, it's now time to pay off a promissory note I placed earlier. In looking at the questions that follow post-positivist philosophy of science, we'll be looking mainly at logic, epistemology, and metaphysics. Well, what about the philosophical questions in axiology that relate to physics? Let's at least set out a couple to think about. Now, you might think that aesthetics, the study of beauty, which largely focuses on questions related to art, has nothing to do with physics. But you'd be wrong. One of my favorite Einstein stories concerns when word of Arthur Eddington's confirmation of general relativity arrived by telegram. It was given to Einstein, who read it with a completely flat affect, and handed it to a graduate student who was in the office. She realized that this was momentous news, yet Einstein was not excited. Baffled, she asked him what his reaction would have been if the result had been otherwise, falsifying his theory. His response was, I would have pity for the dear Lord. The theory is right. Why was Einstein certain that he had the right answer, regardless of what God thought? because the theory was too beautiful to be wrong. Beauty, elegance, coherence, symmetry, these are marks of truth in physics. And Einstein's not the only one who argues this. And I'm not speaking of Keats who wrote, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That's all you know on earth and all you need to know. I'm speaking of figures like Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, who wrote, what is it about nature that lets it happen? that it's possible to guess from one part what the rest is going to do? That's an unscientific question. I do not know how to answer it, and therefore I'm going to give an unscientific answer. I think it's because nature has a simplicity and therefore a great beauty. One of Einstein's influences and personal heroes, Henri Poincaré, wrote, the scientist does not study nature because it's useful to do so. He studies it because he takes pleasure in it, and he takes pleasure in it because it is beautiful. If nature were not beautiful, it would not be worth knowing, and life would not be worth living. So, here we have from Einstein, Feynman, and Poincaré, what Feynman correctly notes is not a scientific question. It's an aesthetic one. The argument they're making is, one, nature is beautiful. Two, this beauty consists, at least in part, but essentially, in its coherence and simplicity. Three, science is the process by which we craft linguistic mathematical representations of nature. Four, representations mirror the internal structure of that which they represent. Therefore, since the beauty of nature is in its structure, science, if it's to be effective, will be beautiful. Who could argue with this? Well. Rene Descartes famously wrote, there's no proposition so obvious that some philosopher somewhere has not objected to it. So who would argue with it? A philosopher, of course. In this case, let's just look at one philosopher, Peter Achenstein, professor of philosophy at Johns Hopkins University and author of the book, Speculation in and About Science. He argues that the second premise in the argument our scientists made is false. Achenstein agrees that beauty, coherence, and simplicity are all virtues of a scientific theory. Pragmatic virtues, he calls them, because 
their useful and helpful aspects that we do desire in our scientific theories. We want our theories to be beautiful because the coherence and simplicity makes scientific theories easier to use. They allow for better, more understandable explanations. They allow us to picture the underlying causes more easily and in a way that can lead to further advances. But the reason there will need to be further advances, Atchenstein argues, is because that's not how nature really is. But Atchenstein is the master of the historical philosophy of science, looking at the most minute details of the processes and logical inferences actually made by great scientists in doing their great work. He argues that when we look at case after case, what we really see are approximations, simplifications, and speculations. The question is not whether nature really is that way, but whether this simplified representation works. The question then is, works for what? The great theories will work for a lot, but of course, not for everything. There will be more intricate questions about nature where the simplified representation will fail to do what we need it to do. The result? The theory gets more complicated. Why? Because nature is more complicated. Yes, we do desire and prize beauty in our science, but not because it's the end of science, but because it's a pragmatic virtue. Unfortunately, it's one virtue that's often in conflict with another virtue, answering all our questions about nature. So, there's just one example of aesthetics in philosophy of physics. The other aspect of axiology is ethics. Physics is an activity done by humans. Anytime you have people engaged in a project, there will always be moral questions. The moral questions surrounding physics often have to do with its abstractness. Physics studies aspects of the world that are so fundamental that they're often quite removed from everyday life. Yet, because of how fundamental the questions are, the tools that are needed to answer these questions, especially in experimental physics and astronomy, are so intricate and often large that they're incredibly expensive. We live in a world in which there's dire poverty. We have fellow humans who don't have their basic needs met. Is the abstract knowledge that physics seeks so valuable that we should take funds that could go to help the needy to find it? One argument is yes. To be human is to wonder about the world. To stop funding science is to rob us of an essential aspect of our own humanity. Another argument in favor of funding physics is to argue that we should be able to fund both that the pitting of science and the well-being of those in need is a false choice when we see what we collectively really spend our money on. Both of these ought to be priorities, and both ought to be funded by cutting back on the much larger spending for other, less virtuous activities. A third argument is utilitarian. Science has a positive technological benefit, so we should fund it for those unforeseen advances that will, in the end, be helpful. This leads to a completely different question. If we justify science through technological advances, does that not also mean that we should hold science and scientists morally culpable when those advances cause harm? Are physicists morally responsible for the uses to which their physics is put by our society? Do physicists have special moral obligations to advise and advocate on science policy? Out of fear that the Nazis would do it first, Einstein wrote a letter to President Roosevelt urging the United States to develop nuclear weapons. After the dropping of those weapons on Japanese cities, Einstein was reported as having said, I could burn my fingers that I wrote that letter. Is Einstein, at least in part, responsible for the deaths of the civilians, the innocent children who died directly or indirectly from cancer because of the dropping of the atomic bombs. He spent his later years advocating against the further development of atomic weapons. Is this something we should expect from all scientists? These are ethical questions that arise from the doing of physics. But those are not the sorts of questions we'll be considering in the rest of our conversations. What we will be looking at 
are the philosophical questions that advances in physics raise concerning how we ought to understand the nature of nature. We already are talking a lot about Einstein, so let's start there. Let's turn to the nature of space and time. We'll do that in our next discussion. So, to misquote an old beer commercial, if you've got the space, I've got the time.